Hello. In this episode of Airs for Architecture, Matthew Fuller and I discuss some ideas from his and Isle Weissman's 2021 book, Investigative Aesthetics, Conflicts and Commons in the Politics of Truth, published by Verso in 2021. Ayers for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to an episode of Ayers for Architecture. I'm talking today to Matthew Fuller, Professor Matthew Fuller, to talk about a book you published quite recently, Investigative Aesthetics, Conflicts and the Commons in the Politics of Truth, which you wrote with Al Weissman. But Matthew, perhaps you could introduce yourself more fully than that. Yeah, I'm a professor of cultural studies at Goldsmiths in the University of London, and I have a background as an artist, working in digital media, but also uh, working in terms of cultural theory. So a lot of what I do is look at aesthetics broad in broad terms as it unfolds through through media systems, forms of perception, and I'm particularly interested in aesthetics in relationship to questions of experience and forms of knowledge. So the 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 work with Ial uh, was uh, part of a, a, a trajectory of work uh, in, for instance, in a book I wrote on sleep, uh, which looks at the way sleep might be said to have uh, a, a, an aesthetic dimension, or how do you how do you have an aesthetics for people that are uh, unconscious. And uh, other work is is looking at uh, in a book Bleak Joys with. Uh, Olga Gurinova is um, looking at ecological aesthetics. So how aesthetics becomes distributed in uh, natural systems or in technical systems and produces uh, certain kinds of experience, certain kinds of effect. Uh, so it's, this this book with Yal is very much um, in dialogue with, with the, that kind of strand of work which tries to look at uh, and expanded aesthetics. So thinking mm-hmm. about aesthetics outside of the traditional disciplines that are uh, kind of assigned custodianship of it. So art history, art, architecture, and so on. That's really interesting, this uh, this idea of an expanded aesthetics. Because I think for most people, uh, perhaps, certainly outside the academy and, and out of perhaps art practice um, and critical practice like your own, Aesthetic still relates to or corresponds to ideas about the um, encounter with an appreciation of beauty. Mm-hmm. That has been ascended beyond. I mean, where where do we stand with it? Where do, where have we come from? Where do we where where are we standing with it in, in terms of your own work? Well, I think it's, I think you're right. This is the, the 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 classical mode of aesthetics from the 18th century, from the work of Jacob Baumgarten and Immanuel mm-hmm. Kant, which describes you know aesthetics as the, the kind of disinterested contemplation of beauty. And this, this is an important tradition. It has, you know, it's kind of sustained uh, art in relationship to um, trying to capture beauty, to kind of to set up experiences of beauty, to formulate notions of beauty that can travel through, through centuries, uh, to allow kind of forms of communication between people. And I think that's... That's been valuable, but I think there is an older tradition. So, in a sense, that we're we're going back uh, to um, a pre-Socratic, ancient Greek tradition of aesthetics, which is to do with sensing more broadly. So, aesthetics is to do with uh, aesthesis, which is is, is sensing, essentially, uh, and that's where we we situate the kind of aesthetics we're interested in in, in investigative aesthetics. So it's very much thinking about um, what sensing is, what the kind of stakes of sensing are in terms of technologies, in terms of politics, how sensing is related to uh, experience and being able to make claims to truth. Uh, so that's that's part of why we make that that move is that um, aesthetics is a broader uh, is a broader category in this way. So it's not just to do with beauty and. In a way, what we're doing is simply a result of the expansion of artistic practices in the 20th century. So they move beyond the representation or articulation of beauty into something that is about a much broader um, expansion of the kinds of experience, the kinds of knowledge, the kind of function that art uh, and architecture and design have. 
Uh, so we wanted a, a theory of aesthetics that could be kind of more adequate to the way in which um, art is art and architecture are practiced in mm. the present. And there's a picked up in your book the the notion that these more 18th century, 19th century ideas around aesthetics are essentially problematic because they are based on a, a, a series of probably Western ideas, but probably upper middle class Western ideas about what and what is it, what is and what isn't beautiful or uh, aesthetic, which has a trajectory towards, I guess, othering and depersoning people in, in the same sort of way. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. I think, but I think you could you could you could describe it in slightly more abstract terms. So that it's not it's not simply uh, about the West or about uh, a particular class formation. That it's they are based on the idea that it's possible to have uh, a universal aesthetics that is the same for every person. And our claim is that aesthetics is more more variegated and more more dynamic and mm. more historically dynamic, more dynamic in terms of the range of senses involved, the, the cultural, political, experiential formations that are involved in uh, articulating and forming subjects that undergo aesthetics. Uh, and we're also interested in a wider, a wider sense of aesthetics, not simply that it's not universal on the one hand uh, and that there's a kind of normative end of aesthetics or no normative result of that universalization of aesthetics that posits uh, a universal entity that would be the ideal uh, experiencer or formulator of aesthetics so you know whether it's whether it's that they happen to be Western or middle class is is irrelevant to a certain extent. It's more, although historically that's the case. And one could also say they're male, white, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but the, there's a, a general impossibility of formulating any uh, universal uh, as as a criteria by which all other acts of sensing might be measured. So it's looking for a, a radically non-standardized uh, aesthetics in this sense, which is which means it's more open, more heterogeneous, more dynamic, more riven with different kinds of textures and conflicts uh, and so on. But also that it becomes important in a way again. Like aesthetics has to a certain extent become the branch of philosophy which has fallen away from significant significance and by imbuing the aesthetic with a kind of pol political or social meaning it it's worth encountering again it's worth addressing again through work yeah absolutely i think this is to make a strong claim for aesthetics as an absolutely foundational mode of, of knowledge and experience that can can engage many other of the, of the different ways in which we categorize or carve up uh, human knowledge, society, life, and so on. Um, so it's, it's to, to make aesthetics foundational to uh, a wide range of, of domains. And that's, what, that's why we think it's important, because the way you sense something, the way you experience something, uh, is the way also, it shapes also the way you understand it. Uh, so it has epistemic dimensions. It has... Uh, questions in relationship to politics and power um you know in the way that if you if you experience something in a certain way what it is that you experience how you experience uh how you sense something what it what is or is not sensible and in what way at what speeds at what degrees of granularity uh and so on shape what can become sayable what can become knowable what's expressible and so on and we think this is has to be taken into account in terms of how you know one describes a relation to the world, whether it's through scientific knowledge, through artistic expression, through um, the kind of investigative work we're interested in, in terms of how you shape claims to truth. In this reading of the aesthetic, in your position on the aesthetic, does this mean that materials themselves 
say, for example, I don't know, the dust that surrounds Fukushima nuclear power reactor. Does that have aesthetic capacity, if that's the right word, out with the experience of the human being encountering it? Does it, does this kind of approach bestow this, what we would see as a higher function, I suppose, um, a higher cognitive function? Uh, yeah, on, on, on stuff, even when we're not there. So the, to the question, if a tree falls down in woods and no one hears it, does it make a sound? The answer would be yes. Yeah, I think there's there's one way of answering that question would be to put a, a, what's called a panpsychic argument. I would love to hear one. Um, which is different to what we're proposing. Uh, so that would be that everything has a certain level of consciousness uh, and, and is has a degree of self-awareness mm-hmm. in, by which it interacts with the world. We're we're arguing something slightly different in the sense that um, we argue that everything senses, uh, that everything is in in a state of interaction with the world, but its state of interaction with the world is is strongly determined by its material composition. So you know, a brick in a wall is very different to uh, senses the world in a very different way than a human who's uh, inside the building of which that uh, brick is is part of. So the brick can experience the wall, or it can experience the world, uh, but it experiences the world in a very limited way. But it can experience the world in a, in a different way than humans do. For instance, uh, when a, a brick receives a bullet uh, in, a, in a conflict, it, rec- it it records that um, that impact in a very direct kinetic way. Um, it may fracture. It may have a, have a hole through it. It'll, it it could be turned to dust depending on the the caliber of the the missile, the impact, the and so on. And so there's a range of ways in which that brick might might crater. It might fracture. It might be pulverized. Um, all of this we see as, as uh, an aspect of its capacity of sensing the world. The sensing is very limited. Uh, it's, it's not reflexive, um, but it is part of a, a complex of material interactions that, um, you know, different kinds of organization of, of matter. So a, a bird or an insect will, will have a different kind of sensual capacity than uh, than a human, uh, but also different to a brick or a stone or a river uh, and so on. But each of these material forms will will be able to produce uh, some kind of sensual is in, is absolutely formed by essential relations to the world. that also means um, that its pattern of reactions to the world uh, provides certain kinds of trace, certain kinds of evidence, certain kinds of disturbance or record that can be uh, interrogated for investigative means. You've raised the word investigations. Obviously, the investigative um, investigative is in the title of the book. And, and I think perhaps the, the subtitle, um, Conflicts and Commons in the Politics of Truth, perhaps relates more to, to that, superficially at least. What What is this, I suppose, position perhaps we might have started with is what what is the objective of this book obviously there is a a sense that the deployment of aesthetics in the sense of sensing to crises uh, and, and critical conditions and Weissman's work looked at the Middle East for um, uh, Israel quite a bit um, previously hasn't it that we have this kind of opportunity to to use our i suppose artistic or material culture practices to do action and good i just wanted to understand a little bit more about the kind of trajectory of this particular book and like where did this particular book come from well i guess <clears throat> it's come i mean Eyal has obviously been engaged with uh forensic architecture as a project for around 15 years i think now um it's an attempt and part of, you know is a kind of renewed uh renewal of trying to understand what what the kind of foundational knowledge or what the kind of activity that uh forensic architecture are involved in 
but also the, the wider network of artists and architects uh, that they're connected to. What is the kind of knowledge that they're producing? What are the criteria by which they might assess their work um, apart from its kind of instrumental value? So, you know, the, there are clear uh, successes uh, where the, the work has, you know, won court cases or has um, won settlements for uh people in conflict with the state or with the police um to get settlements out of court so it's it's successful at, at that level uh it's able to mobilize um audiences and to to generate knowledge uh in the kind of art settings and architecture settings then the question is okay what is what is the more kind of methodological what is layer what is its what is its epistemic framework how does it how does it produce knowledge so this was the question of the book in a sense is really how can we come to terms with uh what it is we're claiming how do we systematize that how do we think about the shift of architecture and the expansion of architecture as an aesthetic practice um not simply as something that makes buildings but also as a way of thinking uh, and as we're viewing the world and of viewing with with great degrees of expertise and acuity uh, relations between material entities uh, in the world and how things, spatial objects, unf unfold over time. How can that be turned into a way of looking at um, political situations or things that are often understood in human rights terms. So the killing of a journalist, for instance, how can architectural um, skills be used to understand how an event uh, like that unfolds over time? Mm -hmm. um, so obviously with, with architecture, you have a whole range of high, highly attuned uh, sets of skills around space and around ways of modeling space, ways of constructing space, measuring it, of using spatial forms to understand uh, other forms of um, record, um, and of, of constructing, for instance, a classic thing we look at in, in forensic architecture's work is the, the use of three-dimensional models to uh, embed photographic and video evidence, um, ballistic evidence, satellite imagery, uh, and so on, and to use the the 3D model as a way of grounding that uh, that evidence, but also testing it and providing a framework in which that evidence can be uh, brought together to um, to see which pieces of evidence work together, which evidence contradict each other, what can be said to be probably true, what can be said to be definitely not true, what can be said to be uh, an actual fact and so we look at how architectural skills can be uh, used in a context outside of building but of understanding space more generally and of what happens in space and of using it to measure uh, and to to, to fine-tune different claims to truth uh, and bring them into some kind of relation of compossibility very fascinating idea, um, and I and I and I like this, particularly like this idea of the kind of comp composition. It's almost like the the work has some kind of genealogy that goes back to I don't know collage making. It's a or bricolage maybe. It's got a kind of very interesting, almost like as you, uh, you know, and it sort of explains your presence within this as an artist and as an expert within um, cultural studies. That, that there is something creative in this process. Is that a fair assumption? Is this a creative process or is it more, because you, you've talked about methodological imperative of sort of establishing the, the how, um, and I'm always interested in methodology. Probably the thing that interests me more, most about research is, is actually how it's done more than anything else. I probably lose attention before, before I get to conclusions, that's the problem. Mm. But I am like, yeah, I'm just very interested in this idea of like, you know, what's the heritage of this kind of methodology? Where does it come from? Um, and is it collage? Is it a creative practice? I think it's creative in the sense that it finds new uses for 
um, existing, well-established, well-honed skill sets. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also that. So that's one layer of creation. I think there's another layer of creation in which um, it kind of reimagines forms of argumentation. Uh, so if the work, a lot of kind of uh, political debate or legal debate is carried out in text uh, or in, in, in language, in spoken language in a courtroom or in written language in, in articles or books, um, what it does is, is think about how can you make a very clear argument about what did or did not happen at a certain point in time in a certain space uh, through forms of architectural reasoning. So it's about how to how to compose an argument uh, within using architectural tools in the work of forensic architecture that we're um, we're particularly interested in. And so this has this has a question. This sets up a question of what is what is the relationship to truth? What is um, how do you go about finding facts? How do you go about dismissing um, things that claim to be truths? How do you have, how do, what are the mechanisms for evaluation and sp spatial reasoning uh and temporal reasoning what what can or cannot exist in the same space and time um can often be also not 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 simply creative but also quite uh maddeningly rationalistic in the sense that you know it, you, you you're trying to find the most uh precise description of uh an event but also find the most precise description of the limits to the knowledge you have about that event based around the resources that are available in terms of what maps are available, what, what video footage, what uh, sound recordings, what kind of uh, GPS data, mobile phone data, and so on can be brought together within, within one model in order to try and make an account of what, what is there at the same, uh, the same time. I'm, I'm really interested in this notion of the truth or post-truth. Just as a uh, as an aside, I think does this mark does this mark the end of the postmodern period? Uh, this kind of moment that we've got to, where there's this reappraisal. I mean, restatement everywhere, all the time, that there is such a thing as truth, which is a remarkable turn of events. I mean, basically post 2016, post Trump, isn't it? Yeah, I think. You have to be cautious uh, about such a claim. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> Never knowingly cautious, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I think as as more as uh, I would say, we're we're interested in fact, which is different to truth. Um, and I think there's a there's a there is the the question of the question of truth is what you try to arrive at. Mm -hmm. uh, but and facts are means by which you which you get to that and even before you get to facts you have to get to the forms by which facts are represented so you have to you know try and triangulate so that these means by which facts are represented might be you know mobile phone video footage of an event it might be um uh, someone's verbal transcription it might be uh, body cam footage from a, a police officer. It might be, uh, you know, satellite imagery, uh, a before and after uh, image. It might be um, analysis, expert analysis of um, a crater produced by a, a missile or a, a, some some other kind of explosion. So you need to find ways of looking at those. Um, those entities, whether they're whether they're technical descriptions or they're mediatic descriptions of something, and try and find ways of triangulating them and testing, using them to test each other to find out which makes the best description of what it is you're trying to understand, uh, what it is you're trying to describe, and that's um, that's something that's that's about representation in a way. So you know if if, if the art world has, say, 200 years of testing representation. Uh, it makes it, you know, through the many, many different 
uh, art historical waves of different approaches to painting or photography or um, different styles uh, or technical con constructs that allow for an engagement with a portrait, a landscape, uh, an experience. All of those give us uh, a kind of set of resources that we can also use to analyze uh, the technical, uh, which is often described, you know, which is often used in order to account for a particular historical event, a murder, a human rights violation, a state crime, an act of pollution, of deforestation, and so on. So, but all of these have to be um, taken cautiously and in terms that recognize their capacity for sensing. So, what the specific technical structure is of, it, of an image, what its degree of granularity is, how it how sensitive it is to certain kinds of light under certain kind of lighting conditions, and so on, uh, that allow for a, a, a more kind of humble approach to the establishment of facts, um, which you know then requires collaboration with multiple other kinds of uh fact proposing or fact determining devices so what we're, what we're interested in this book is this um things like spatial models uh produced by architects in forensic architecture allow for multiple candidate facts to be assembled and tested together and we're interested also then in you know what we call the investigative commons which is wider processes of elaborating alliances with different kinds of knowledge uh, witnesses, victims of, of violence, uh, social social groups, political campaigns, uh, scientific knowledge, technical knowledge, of finding ways of bringing those together so that um, stronger claims to fact, which can then also get at uh, truth uh, in certain ways, can be can be set up, can be articulated. Yeah, I was thinking as you were talking. Uh, just then and, and, and earlier about this idea of these architectural tools, I suppose, as you call them, that where do they, where do they derive from? Because I think from, for, again, for, for young, young students and even practitioners of architecture, architecture's tools are fairly limited. They're a, they're a device for representing the fronts of buildings and sometimes the plan. What are we talking about when we're talking about tools here? You've talked about the spatial dimensions of things, and obviously the role of uh, technology is becoming more and more paramount. Are we talking here about non-standard tools or stuff that is common to the practice of architecture itself? Well, in a sense, architecture is always in dialogue with, although not reducible, to geometry. And, you know, so the, the tools that are built around the basic understanding of the world in geometric terms, like uh, three-dimensional modeling tools, CAD, mm -hmm. game engines, uh, all of these can be useful in uh, assembling models of the world, which then the world can be uh, measured against, tested against, and so on. It sort of imbues, it takes back, I mean, one of the things that I've noticed over the over the years of my doing architecture, so I started studying architecture in that horrific period at the beginning of the new Labour government, where uh, it was about making the most idiotic shape humanly possible for a lot of money. And we've moved into an, a, a, a period where the ethics of architecture has become paramount, not least in relation to issues around environmental sustainability, ecology, but also in relation to things like crises of cash, like people aren't very rich anymore, or a lot of people, some people are really rich, other people aren't. And I think that, that this, this idea of then redeploying the, the language and the, the logics of architecture towards uh, an ethically just end is, is obviously relates to that. And I think that's already, I think that's really beautiful. And this idea of a kind of activist practice. I was just wondering, in relation to that, I, I don't know the art world hugely well, but my, my, I assume that just as architecture was disappearing up its own arse, in the uh, late part of the 20th century, art, art was perhaps finding itself down the same cul-de-sac and has found through uh, instruments like yours, through 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 um, forensic architectural type approaches, a way of resituating itself at the center of cultural discourse, of, of becoming more important than perhaps in the late 20th century it had become, where it was decorative, essentially. 
Is that is that part of the objective? Is the objective to make the art world relevant? I think not to make the art world relevant, but more to say that art art is very is very heterogeneous. There there is no singular art world now in, in the way that you might be able to say uh, up to the let's say 1980s you might have been able to say there was a, there was a kind of consistent art world mm-hmm. um maybe even that is too generous maybe you know we're looking at say 1960s i think there are many different art worlds and they have many different logics and many different kinds of uh degrees of attention to certain aspects of what art might be but i think art is in a in a state of uh, expansion and of unfolding in in many different directions, and I think that's why you're, there are many different kinds of argument abroad at the moment about you know what is or is not art, what is inside and what is outside. So there's um, we're we're for a very kind of open and uh, expansive definition of what what art is, um, but there are also much that. Uh, there, there are many who also have, you know, a, a much more traditionalist approach that art is to do with questions of the the gestation of feeling, the uh, the understanding and representation of beauty, uh, and so on, mm. which you know, is is certainly part of it. Uh, but we we think that art has changed um, through multiple different trajectories. You know the the demand and the forceful entry of uh women uh of n- non-white artists of, of black artists uh and so on into art history in a way that just cannot be ignored uh also institutional changes to art schools uh which you know develop I- different ideas of art as, as a form of research mm-hmm. It also changes the nature of art. Um, then you have, uh, let's say, mar- what what were hitherto kind of marginal art practices such as uh, media arts or digital arts that also um, change forms of emphases, uh, change kinds of expertise, change ways in which art is spoken about uh, in order to reconstitute the terrain of what art is. Um, and part of this can be, you know, run through the history of art in the 20th century from the avant-garde in which, you know, art was everything. Art could change your entire way of life, your politics, your mode of eating, your mode of, of being in the world to, um, you know, the, the, the conceptual art, which, you know, looked at non-traditional forms of expressing philosophical approaches to, to matter, to the world to the constitution of, of ideas, uh, to the kind of so-called post-media phase in art, in which art was no longer limited to uh, performance or to video or to, to sculpture or to painting, but that art was something that was much more uh, much more expansive and artists would, would work across media or work in, non, uh, um, in, in, in ways that weren't uh, pre-established uh, through different forms of action in the world. Mm-hmm. So we we see that the art uh, art more generally is is becoming a much more open field, which is not to say that there aren't highly traditional, highly conservative forms of operation within the art world. There are there are clearly many of those, and in order to stabilize the art world as something that can uh, furnish billionaires with objects worth millions of pounds, certain you know highly highly powerful means of stabilization have to be in occurrence, which can run through institutional forms, forms of criticism, forms of art production, forms of education, forms of market, uh, and so on. So we're also, you know, we have to be cognizant that that's happening, but art itself as a much wider field is, uh, you know, is, is, is connected to that in complex ways. Um, but it's something much bigger than than simply, uh, you know, pro- production of a certain class of financial asset. How has the digital? So you've mentioned digital art, for example, as something that has expanded the field. And before we were recorded, you mentioned you were 
uh, Vivering, if such a word exists, Vivering a, um, a PhD on, on, on games production, for example. How has the digital field impacted and inflected the work of forensic architecture? Is forensic architecture and, and this sort of investigation dependent upon the digital? Is this, is your work, is this book the fruit perhaps of the digital turn? It's, uh, it's possible. Uh, I think you could have an, uh, you could have an investigative aesthetics that was purely, that was purely analog, but it would take very different forms. Um, I think there are, there are examples of artists carrying out work before uh, computers became a kind of primary seat of culture. Um, I think of someone like Hans Hacker and uh, his, his 1972 work, uh, Shapolsky et al., a real-time social system in which he deploys, you know, photo image um, type conceptual art in order to map a system of property ownership. So what he does is go to an area of Manhattan, take photographs of the building facades, and then lists uh, the owners of those of the separate properties within those buildings. And then makes a separate network diagram of relations between those property owners. So it shows that many of them are shell companies for a, for a particular company uh, and shows the pattern of ownership uh, within these, these sets of streets, which happen to be primarily slums, uh, and looks at who's legally owning them uh, and who is the ultimate owner and benefactor of the, of the revenue derived from them. So it's... Uh, you know, it's, it's something done in entirely analog terms, but it's something that mixes conceptual art strategies of mixing photography and text with more investigative practices, looking at company ownership. So classic investigative journalist uh, activities. So that would be an example of a, a, a non-computational investigative aesthetics. For forensic architecture, a lot of their work is, is something... Um, it is based around computational activities and so making three-dimensional models and then bringing together materials sourced from social media, from smartphone videos, from satellite footage, from many other sources of data into those, uh, into those models, creating timelines, correct, creating composite images, which allow for the assessment of the, of the data. So this is, this is fundamentally computational. I would say another layer would be the importance of machine learning in the present. Uh, so when you're, you know, you, you're trying to understand what happened in a certain city on a certain day, um, there might be in order to find out, you know, whether there's any data available around a certain event, um, you need to triage sometimes tens of thousands of hours of social media footage in order to catch a glimpse of an, a cloud, an explosion cloud or the movement of a tank or the presence of a person uh, and so on. So you need to use um, machine learning in order to detect the presence of these, of these entities within the available video or photo footage. So the computational layers are, are, are multiple and of many kinds. Um, and that brings with it its own question of aesthetics. You know, what is the aesthetic of a file format or of uh, a, a video, a video format in making certain kinds of things sensible and making other things less easy to gain traction on? I was thinking about the way in in, in your in, towards the conclusion of the book, you talk about the idea of the commons again, the investigative commons, which you've mentioned already. This kind of coalescing of fragments of knowledges. Um, in a very kind of pluralist manner. And the digital seems to me to be the space in which that commons is most amenable. It's almost as if in the context of being a modern person, we are or have been and have found a space in which common experience can be shared. And that kind of liveliness that I suppose perhaps romantically characterizes our image of the commons can be realized once again. Whereas in fact, urban space and the material environment we live in has become less and less able to, to, to actually do that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it would be possible to design cities uh, and to, to live cities as commons. You know, I think, I think there are definite decisions that have been made to make 
urban spaces in the present um, less inhabitable. Um, and I think, you know, there could be many other forms that, that cities and property relations and uh, the politics of cities could take. But I think there is um, there is also this sense in which even though we, we live in increasingly privatized realities, um, those the, the capacity of making societies, the capacity of making uh, life requires requires collaboration, requires commons, mm -hmm. uh, requires labor. Uh, if we think of you know the, the the amazing revelation that was found uh, during COVID that societies relied on care workers, relied on delivery workers, relied on very basic, badly rewarded uh, forms of um, forms of labor that are absolutely fundamental to contemporary society. This kind of revelation uh, could form the basis for a new kind of commons. That is a kind of collective valuation of the work that is done that uh, produces the possibility for society. And we can say that, you know, forms of privatization and forms of uh, the, the, the turning inwards of, uh, of, of social forms rely absolutely fundamentally on mutual aid, on care, on collective labor. Uh, and perhaps it's time also to, you know, find ways in which that can be expressed in terms of uh, the built environment in different mm -hmm. ways. And what we think is that uh, this foundational capacity of people to collaborate mm -hmm. uh, is something that can also be uh, elaborated in terms of coming together to produce political arguments of producing knowledge about events uh, and this requires yeah a collective non-hierarchical approach which can um, gather together and work with different forms of knowledge and different forms of experience always recognizing that you know those most impacted by uh, an event, whether it's a state crime, whether it's a police murder, whether it's an environmental catastrophe, those most impacted are usually the people with the most important things to say and the most the most in depth knowledge of um, of what's happened, mm -hmm. and that knowledge may be heavily heavily conditioned by trauma. It may be you know conditioned by other you know forms of of, of social violence of inhibition of uh of threat of violence and so on but that's that absolute kind of uh foundational knowledge that is had uh needs to be incorporated in any investigative practice for it to be to to, to really get access to uh strong claims to truth does it, this investigative aesthetic that you describe, which is largely deployed, as I understand it, in conditions of crises, that is of violence rather than, say, for example, inequalities of power. Does it have the potential, and I think judging by what you've just said, it possibly does, to describe conditions of perhaps more subtle disempowerment, structural violence, spatial injustice? Is the methodology that you articulate this aesthetic investigation, uh, investigative process, is it something that has broader application to understand, for, say, for example, the way that Sheffield City Centre no longer seems to be a uh, kind of commons as we understood it, but has become a privatised space? Yeah, I think the work of forensic architecture has been often around specific events, you know, things that happen within a few seconds or a few minutes, uh, maybe unfold over a few hours, like a particular military event, a particular uh, kinetic event, let's say. And these are, geometry is a very useful way of understanding those. And, you know, if, if, if architecture is uh, partly the, the, the means for unpacking and experimenting with uh, geometrical forms of knowledge, which is a very narrow definition of, of architecture, but it's it's one that might you know might be useful in this context. 
You could also say that this uh, could be unfolded into longer spheres of time. Um, you know, so a lot of what forensic architecture have done um, is to think about how very small uh, points of time, so half a second, for instance, un is folded into much larger scales of time. So, for instance, when you have uh, the killing of someone on the street by a police officer who claims that they're acting in self-defense, what is it that makes that officer feel that their their defense requires or their their, their response uh requires uh a violent action you know so for instance in a the, there's a case in which um uh, an, a chicago police officer shoots dead uh an unarmed man because the police officer claimed that he thought he was armed uh, what is it that makes that officer think that the best explanation for someone's movement, the movement of someone's arm, is that they're about to go for a gun or that they have a gun in their hand? Um, you know, in this case, forensic architecture's argument is that um, the work um, of, of, of creating that split second decision is the result of centuries of cultural formation of political formation that produce subjects that are trained to behave and believe in certain ways so reactions that take a split second may take centuries to accumulate and it's about unpacking the relations between the very specific event and the wider formations that produce it um, that happens in those in those kind of cases now in terms of you know how a spatial formation like uh, like Sheffield City Centre, uh, which you know could be could be unpacked in different ways, could be uh, investigated. Um, I think it would be interesting to think. Okay, what what would be required to make that kind of claim? What are the determining movements and changes to uh, to the space, the mode by which people inhabited it? What what would be the determining factors? how would you analyze them how would you gain access to records of them that would that would give you certain kinds of evidence or certain each with a certain kind of propensity to make claims of truth uh well and certain kinds of difficulty in making claims to truth so that's would be more of a kind of methodological perspective and how, what kind of you know thinking what are the preconditions mm -hmm. to be able to make the kind of claim you're looking for mm -hmm. Uh, and I, you know, certainly that could be that could be possible, um, but it would it would need a different kind of methodological assemblage and mm -hmm. a different assemblage of people, equipment, materials, modes of knowledge, forms of assembly that would allow that to to be done. Thank you very much, Matt. I think that's a great point to finish on. Great, thanks very much. And so it goes. Thank you to Matthew for taking the time and to Verso for the book. Links to it and to Professor Fuller are in the podcast description. Thanks for listening.